two hours, <laughs> and my, my legs are like raw. Yeah. It's still it's it's still it like is. Was it at four ninety nine? Not really. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. You'll give Man. me ten minutes to stop that. <laughs> Yeah, they always say Ooh. don't wait till you can't do it now. Because they should be all flabby and jiggly. And they're <laughs> <laughs> Too much of a <laughs> that, That's how I know. So I tell that, David, that's I'm always he waits till the very end. Doing that. Oh, so that's what I mean, if he, because it all, it's gonna, gravity's going to take it down. Yep. So, and yeah, well, we try to see which get it, everyone here, yeah, the heart like will back up and out. Maybe the heart's not strong enough. Oh, we did, we had six and a half. Yeah, uh, and my daughter, the lower voters are giving me six and a half, not working. Yeah. New territory. Yeah. My daughter to watch our territory, so we have to be careful what we do. We watch it. Oh, it's only 12 gallons. Oh, Carolina? Yeah, two minutes to go. They say people are flying. Or my other daughter. That third period? Yeah. But wait till that goes. I'm a ranger. I just, well, I'm a coyote. Yeah. Remember I told you I grew up. Two minute warning. Yeah, I just. I just left there at one nothing. Yeah, they were. With the Coyotes old goal against Toronto. Now it's one one. I I was I was ready to become a ranger. And then when they said Rob Rindemore, I was like, oh. He's a Carolina coach. He was a long time flyer. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, he, you can see it. He's all beat up. His face is. Yeah. <laughs> So when I walk out the door, she's like, okay, but they had ladies who were pumping their breasts on the Yeah, I did, I did survive. I was thinking about you when I was out there. Or drugs. I had to Get my did you get my response back? Like I, said, I don't know anything. Really All right, everybody, let's get our seats. It's time to get going. All right. Right. Well, welcome, everyone. We're going to continue our study. We're going to look at a, two great chapters tonight. Now, I call them great because Revelation chapter 12 and 13, we see a great sign, we see a great dragon, we see a great wrath, we see a great eagle, and it's just, that's why I call it great study. So, let's open in prayer and we'll get right into it tonight. Father, we're so grateful that we can study your word and we pray that tonight, Holy Spirit, as always, that you would be the teacher and we ask God that... Father, that you are not the God of confusion, so we ask that you would help us to understand what you have given to your people. Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to see the personal application of all of this 
and to recognize as the sons of Issachar in the Old Testament, be able to recognize the signs of our time, Lord God, and that we would be prepared, that we would know, and Father, that we would go into all the world and preach the gospel, because the time is short, Lord, so we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. All right, everyone ready for the warm weather? It's upon us. Love, who said love it? Snowbirds. <laughs> All right, Revelation chapter 12. You will recall that so far uh, where we are in the seven-year tribulation period, that Israel will enter into a covenant that's brokered by the Antichrist for seven years. That was prophesied in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. We see all of that happening. We've seen up to this point the, um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, trumpet judgments. Chapter 11, verse 15, which we covered last time. <coughs> excuse me, I might have to take a drink here pretty quick. Um, I do, excuse me. I'm starting to lose my voice, I guess. My wife's been praying or something. <laughs> <laughs> Losing my voice. <laughs> oh. All right. As we've seen between these sets of judgments, we've seen that there's an interlude and that uh, God gives John some behind-the-scenes the, the events, what's going on. And that's what we're looking at. We're, we're, we're not in the judgments, but we're seeing what's going on. So with that, uh, chapter 11, verse 15, we saw, And the seventh angel sounded, and there was loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And now we're going to look behind the scenes and see how all of that is taking place. So if you would with me, <clears throat> chapter 12, verse 1, it says, now a great sign, that's our first great of the night, this great sign, remember what a sign is in the Bible. A sign is an extraordinary event that points beyond itself to something of even greater significance. In Luke chapter 21, verse 11, and again in verse 25, we see that uh, we're told that these signs are symbolic, but they represent a reality. Excuse me, just a moment. <coughs> I'm so sorry. I don't know what's happening here. Um, all right. Uh, the Gospel of John, this unique Gospel of John, is made up of seven signs about Jesus, all pointing to him. And, and so that's what this is. What we're about to see points to something that's, that's going to have this great significance. And he says here in still verse 1, he sees this sign in heaven. Remember, friends, everything that's taking place on earth has a connection to heaven. One of the things we as Christians need to understand and never forget is that we are in a spiritual battle, <laughs> right? We're told in the New Testament that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, even though it manifests in the flesh and blood sometimes, right? And the married people said amen. <laughs> But we have to understand there's a spiritual conflict going on, Amen. right? And he's seeing into the spiritual conflict, and this is amazing. He sees this, this sign in heaven, and he sees a woman. Now, next to that, if you want, right next to that, the name Israel. Now, there are a lot of people who claim that this woman are different people, but I'm going to show you from the scripture. Remember, we use the scripture to study the scripture, Amen. that this Amen. is the nation of Israel. Amen. However, there are some false teachers, false religions out there, uh, the first one being the Catholics, who claim that this is the Virgin Mary, and all of their artwork, you've probably seen it, depict this, this picture, uh, but we're going to see that it, it's, not, it's not Mary. Amen, some say that uh, it is a picture of the New Testament church, it can't be a picture of the New Testament church because the church doesn't give birth to Jesus. That's right. Jesus gave birth to the church, right? right? So it can't be Jesus. Now, there is another group that says this is Mary. Now, not Mary of Mary and Joseph, but Mary Baker Eddy. How many of you know who she is? Oh, yeah. Well, she made this claim that this is her and that the, the, the child she births is the Christian science cult that she led. And she claimed that that this is her, and that the man-child that she gives birth to um, is the Christian science cult, and that the dragon we're about to meet is the, check this out, her words, the mortal mind of us attempting to destroy her and her new religion. Crazy. People are crazy, aren't they? Yeah. Right? Well, again, we study the Word of God with the Word of God, and we learn that this is Israel. I need a volunteer. I meant to assign these, and... Uh, 
I didn't, but who would like to turn to Isaiah 54, verse 5 and 6? Candace is going to do that. While she is doing that, I'm going to give you guys some other scriptures to write down that says the same thing to verify that this woman is the nation of Israel. So in your notes, if you're writing, you can write down Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. Hosea chapter 2, verse 16, and Ezekiel 16, 32. They all say and confirm to us that this woman is Israel. And then, Candace, do you have that? Isaiah 54, verse 5 and 6 tells us this. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. He is called the rock of all the earth. The Lord will call you back as if you were a wife deserted and distressed in spirit, a wife who married young, only to be rejected, says your God. And he's speaking to the nation of Israel. So this woman is Israel. Notice it says she's clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet. Now it's very interesting. The sun and she's standing on the moon. The sun and the moon, they're objects of, of light conveyance, right? How many of you watched the, the, uh, the eclipse of the moon the other night? That's pretty cool, right? That's pretty cool. Everyone waiting to go to see Jesus, and I was like, no, I just might as well turn TV on because, you know, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're prophesying it, it ain't going to happen, right? God <laughs> kind of told that. But it was very cool to look at. Well, we, the nation of Israel, was called to convey the light of God to the world. They were to be lights to the world, manifesting in the Son, Jesus. What did Jesus call his followers? He said, you will be what? lights of the world that is our job right that's all part of God's we are called to be witnesses for God just as the nation of Israel was called to be um, uh, a witness for God so she's got this and then on her head uh, she has a garland that's like a, a a crown type thing and on this crown there are 12 stars now these 12 stars represent the 12 tribes of Israel how do we know that Genesis chapter 7 uh, verse excuse me, Genesis chapter 37, verses 9 through 11, tells us in this dream that Joseph had that he and his, that the brothers are the what? Twelve stars. So we know that this is a picture of Israel. Now, it says in verse 2, she's being with child. Again, when, when God formed the nation, the Messiah didn't come right away, right? It's going to take a while, just like a child in the womb develops before it's born. Israel didn't give birth to the Messiah for a few years. It says, so she cried out in labor pains to give birth. The history of the nation of Israel has always been a very tough existence. Once they went to Egypt, uh, things really got bad for them, right? And Pharaoh was always persecuting them. Haman in the days of Esther was persecuting them. <coughs> Hitler in our own time was, was persecuting them. What's that goofy guy's name in, in Iran that just a few years ago was calling for them to be run off into the ocean and all that? Uh, call for their destruction. You might recall a few years ago, President Obama demanded, in his arrogancy, he demanded that they give uh, their land and the, the rule of Jerusalem over to the Muslims. Remember that? The world has always been against the, the Hebrew people, but God has always been for them. And so it's with great apparel and great labor pains she is having this child. Verse 3 says, Now another sign appeared in heaven. So this is going along with this behold a great fiery red dragon now if we drop down to verse 9 that tells us that this dragon is satan he originated in heaven we're going to look at some scriptures here in a minute to tell his story well this is interesting about satan he's got seven heads and ten horns and seven diadem or crowns upon his heads. Now this is very interesting. He's red. Remember what the red horse of the second seal represented? Bloodshed and murder. Satan's nature is to what? Kill, steal, and destroy. He's not a nice guy. Uh, he's also the father of lies. He's also the accuser of the brethren. He has all this stuff. But in here and in this end time thing, here he has seven heads. Now this is not in concrete. But it's in pretty firm footing. A lot of people believe that these seven heads are the uh, uh, seven consecutive world governments of history under Satan's domain, dominion. Uh, starting with the Assyrians, 
who did, who did Israel go into captivity to? We're studying about this on Sundays. The Assyrians. Then the Egyptians. Then the Babylonians. Then the Medo-Persians. Then the Greeks. And the six were the old Roman Empire, with the seventh being the revived Roman, Roman Empire. Well, that one's still to come, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people believe that's those seven heads. But on those heads are ten crowns, these ten uh, horns, excuse me, these ten horns with, 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 um, on them. This is so interesting, friends. Check this out. If you're like me, have you ever wondered, how is the world going to be divided into ten countries? I mean, we got a big world, right? We have a lot of countries, and we see a lot of stuff happening, and we know God's going to do it because it's in the Bible. But how many of you have heard things are happening so quick in our world, of the Trilateral Commission, right? You know what the Trilateral Commission, what, they're, what they are doing and setting up in our world, and they're working on it today, is dividing our planet into ten regions. Region one being Canada and the United States. Region two being the European Union and Western Europe. Region three being Japan, they get their own. Region 4 being Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and the Pacific Islands. Region 5 being e Eastern Europe. Region 6 being Latin America, Mexico, Central, and, Southern, and South America. Region 7 being North Africa and the Middle East. Region 8 being Central Africa. Region 9 being South and Southeast Asia. And Region 10 being Central Asia. Now, isn't that fascinating? Right? And each one of those regions, I mean, you, the, the countries in those regions will be self-governed, so to speak, but yet they will have a main leader over each of the regions. Now, also, let me throw this out there. Uh, and this is just clay thinking. You know, I, I try to run all these scenarios, but it was really troubling to me, and it should be troubling to you guys, that, that our current uh, false president is turning over the care of the American people to, to the WHO, the World Health Organization. Yeah. Right? Can you imagine people turning over the care of everybody to one organization, and they're doing this around the world? So could these heads be those type of heads? You have one guy over the head of all the health of, of the world. Can you imagine Bill Gates being in charge of that? He's already told us he's, he's going to kill us. He th he's not even hiding it. And then someone over the currency. Well, that would make sense why there'd be one world currency. Yeah. And one over transportation. You know, you could, you could divide it into these ten regions. Isn't that fascinating? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen. But I'm not saying that's not going to happen. That's right. What we know is going to happen is somehow this world's going to be divided into ten, however they do it, right? And it's going to just be wild. And so, anyway, let's get back to our text here. So, uh, um, Verse 4, talking about Satan still, right? With his tail, he drew a third of the stars, stars being um, angels, Job 38, 7, Ezekiel 28, 11, Isaiah 14, all tell us this, that these are angelic beings. So here he takes an, uh, angels that rebel with him, and they're, they're fallen angels. Some people call them demonic spirits. But a third of the angels join with him. Turn with me, please. I'm going to invite you to turn with me in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 14. <clears throat> I was just there, and I... <laughs> Here we go. And we're going to start reading... At verse 12. When you're there, just say amen. amen. Okay, let's start reading Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. This is talking about Satan. How you have fallen from heaven. And we learned in, in the book of Revelation, that's where he started from, right? From heaven. O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you were cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations and... Would you not say that's what he is doing even to this day? <laughs> He's destroying people because he hates people. Verse 13. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. 
Who are the stars of God? The angels. He wanted to be, he wasn't happy being one of the top four angels. He wanted to be above God. And so he's trying to exalt himself. Also, I will sit on the mount of the congregation. He not only wanted to be in charge of the angelic world, he wants to be in charge of the human world. On the farther side of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High God. Boy, didn't he spread that lie to Eve? Yep. You'll be like God. He, that, he's telling people that today. You can be little gods. There, are, there are, are preachers on TV and on the radio and on the Internet who, who are claiming we're little gods. <laughs> but here is his demise, verse 15. And you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths, of the pit. Now that's still to come, but it's going to happen. Verse 16, those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, this is the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms. Now we're about to read about all this stuff in the book of Revelation. Who made the world a wilderness. He de he, he, he's destroying the world. We, we see that happening now, right? Yeah. You know, I'm all for taking care of the environment and all that stuff, but this whole new green, new green New Deal and stuff, that's going to destroy our earth, not yeah, save it. That's right. And that's what Satan wants to do. God made this earth for us, and he's going to do everything he can to destroy everything God did for us. Look what he's doing to families. Amen. Look what he's doing to, to religion. Look what he's doing to marriages. Look what he's doing to, to humans. What I mean by that is this whole gender nonsense, yeah. right? You shook nations, and you made the world into a wilderness, and you destroyed cities who did not open the house of the prisoners. Now, this is a great, uh, this is talking about the exiles when they were exiled. But, you know, uh, we see Satan holding prisoners today with addictions. He's good at holding prisoners. Anyway, uh, let's go now to uh, Ezekiel. That's just forward a few pages from Isaiah. Ezekiel chapter 28. You'll come to Jeremiah and Ezekiel. <clears throat> and we'll start reading verse 11. Everyone there? Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. Now, we won't go into it all night here, but this is not the physical king of Tyre, called a prince in the earlier verses. This is Satan himself, Amen. and it, it tells us that in the text. Here's what you say to him, still in verse 11. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in, the, in Eden, the garden of God. Well, there were only two humans in Eden, Adam and Eve. But here, Satan Lucifer was, was with them. And every precious stone was your covering. And he named the, the stones. Uh, the workmanship of your timbrels and your pipes were prepared on the day you were created. He was a created being. He was a musical being. He was a be beautiful being. Verse 14 says, He was an anointed cherub who covers. I established you, and you were holy on the holy mountain of God. And you walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. He, he, he ministered to God and with the people and and boy, he had a good job. Yeah. <laughs> and you were perfect in all your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity, pride, was found in him. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stone. You can keep reading. He talks about that. But here we see that twice now, Satan has been kicked out of heaven. In his original sinning, he was kicked out of heaven and he lost his, his place of service of God. He moved from Lucifer, the angelic being, to Satan, the dragon, the serpent, whatever you want to call him, right? Now, what we are reading in the book of Revelation is the second and the final eviction out of heaven. We know that from the book of Job and, and, we, and other places in the Bible that right now Satan has access to heaven. He, he has access to the throne room of God. And he, he goes there making accusations against us. Yes, he does. Now just think about your day today. I had a good day today. Praise the Lord. 
But Satan could accuse me of doing some dumb things today. Now, in my mind, I, I help people today. You know, I, I, a, a guy cut me off in the car, and instead of, I gave him a thumb finger, and not a finger finger. I gave him a thumb down, not a finger. Right? Everyone with me? <laughs> you can take the boy out of Buckeye, but you can't take the Buckeye out. But, you know, but he can be accusing me of just being the most rotten guy in the world. Yeah. And same for you guys. Now, some of you guys might have done something bad today. I don't know. I don't, I'm not going to look at you because I don't know. But, right? <laughs> but he has access to accuse us. He's the accuser of the brethren. But as we're reading here, and we believe this is going to be about the midway point of the tribulation, I believe this is going to be right after he makes that abomination of desolation. Because that's when everything's really going to kick off and explode. Right? And so here, back in Revelation, he, uh, he get his guys to revolt against him. And look what happens. I'm still in verse 4. And the dragon stood before the woman. Who's the woman? Israel. Israel. Who was ready to give birth. And here's what he's doing. To devour her child as soon as it's born. Now see, Satan, from, from the time that God was bringing up and establishing Israel, he, he had to wait till the child was born to kill him. Now he's figured out how to kill him before they're born. He went to the midwives of, of the Hebrews and said, as soon as that baby boy's born, snap its neck. Yep. Right? Herod, Matthew chapter 2. As soon as Jesus was born, he sent them out. And what did they do? Killed all the babies. What did Pharaoh had them do? Kill all the babies, right? The devil loves killing babies. What's the potential in a child? It's unlimited. If we would raise that child up in the way that he or she should go, which is following Jesus, that child would be unlimited. Right? Well, all he wants to do is stop the Messiah. Stop the Messiah. Verse 5, she, the woman, Israel, she bore the male child. That's Jesus. Who was to rule the nation with a rod, and her child was caught up into heaven. Now, this is very interesting because here we see three aspects of Jesus' life. Two have been fulfilled, one haven't. Have, hasn't. It says here in verse 5, she bore a male child who was to rule. That's literally the word to shepherd, right? That's what he came to be, to shepherd us. And to rule the nations with the rod of iron. Now turn with me forward in your Bible to Revelation 19, 15. This hasn't happened yet. Now, as our Lord and Savior, he is to rule in our life, right? But he doesn't rule with the rod of iron. I think sometimes he... <laughs> He wants to pop us over the head with one because some of us are, th are thick-headed, right? So <laughs> and wives are going to their husbands. But this ruling rod of iron, this is still to take place in the future. Your Revelation 19, look at verse 15. It says, Now out of, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he shall strike the nations, and he himself, what? Will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the wine presses of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God. This is when he comes back. This is the final thing to set up the millennial kingdom. So that part of this prophecy is still future. He was born to shepherd his people. And the last part, caught up to God and his throne. He has ascended. Acts chapter 1 verse 9. He had his own little rapture there. He's already gone, right? So two of the three things here. He, he has fulfilled. Now, it's interesting, uh, in this prophecy of, of Revelation, John doesn't talk anything about his earthly ministry while he was here. Why is that? Because the purpose of Revelation is to tell us the purpose of Jesus coming. Amen. And that was to what? To redeem us, to shepherd his people, to rule the world, and sit down at the right hand of the Father. <laughs> Very cool. Well, let's check this out in verse 6. It says, then the woman fled into the wilderness. Who's the woman? Israel. Israel. Where she was placed, where she has a place, prepared by God. In your Bibles, please underline those three words, prepared by God. And turn with me, please, to Matthew 
chapter 24. Matthew 24, you'll recall, is the great, great teaching of Jesus about these end time things. In Matthew 24, verse 15. Everyone there? Mm -hmm. Jesus is talking about all this, and he says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, this is uh, prophesied in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. We, it's also talked about in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. We know it happens at the midway point of the tribulation, right? Right the midway point? point. We all in agreement with that? Amen. Look what he says to do after that happens. <coughs> Verse 16. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. You get out of Dodge when that happens. Go back to our text here in Revelation. We are seeing this fleeing. She flees into the wilderness. That sounds scary, but there's a place prepared by God in there. Okay? Uh, people wonder, where is this place? Where is this wilderness? Now, this is very cool. Isaiah chapter 16, verses 1 through 5 tells us. <coughs> Isaiah 16. 1 through 5 says this. Send the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah to the wilderness to the mount of the daughter of Zion. That's Jerusalem. For it shall be, be as a wandering bird thrown out of the nest, so shall the daughters of Moab at the fords of Ar Arnon. Take counsel, execute judgment, make your shadow like the night in the middle of the day, hide the outcast. The outcasts are the people the, people of Israel who are, are running, who are hiding. He's telling the host nation, you hide them. Do not betray him who escapes. You know, there are a lot of people during the Holocaust that, that hid Jews and helped Jews and transported Jews. You know, they might not have been blessed a lot here on the earth. They might have even got thrown in prison and executed. But let me tell you what, God honored them people. Amen. And this is what he's telling them to do here. He says, be a shelter to them from the face of the spoiler. For the extortioner is at an end and devastation ceases. The oppressor are consumed out of the land. In mercy, the throne will be established and one will sit on it in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking justice and, ha and hastening righteousness. This prophecy tells us this, the Selah, a.k.a. Petra slash rock, is what Bible scholars believed is the Petra, <laughs> the rock city in modern day Jordan. Now most of us know it because of the Indiana Jones movies. They, <laughs> seriously, it's, it's magnificent. They, the, the city is built into the rocks and God has, has kept it safe and protected all these years and it's uninhabited, but it, it will hold a multitude of people. And it's right there in Turkey. Now check this out. It gets even more gooder. Check this out. <laughs> October 26, 1994. Y'all were alive then, right? <laughs> Isn't it weird to think in, 19, in the 1990s that <laughs> most of our world wasn't born yet? <laughs> but on October 26, 1994, King Hussein of Jordan and and uh, Israel's prime minister, along with Rabbi Rabin Yatin, I don't say his name. These three signed a treaty, and the treaty was to promote tourism between Jerusalem and Jordan, and they constructed a highway known as the King's Highway, opening a free-flowing transport route between Jerusalem and Jordan, where Petra, the rock city, is. God in his wisdom has worked everything out. Because it says right here, God prepared a place for them. Now, this is very interesting. Because a lot of people freak out at the fish in the book of Jonah. I have, I, I swear to you, I've heard arguments in sanctuaries. It's a fish. It's a whale. It's a fish. Okay, I'm not a biologist. I know the difference between boys and girls, 
But I don't know the difference between whale and fish. If, if, they're, if, they're, if they're water creatures swimming, they're a fish to me. And if they're big, it's a whale. I don't care, right? But what they miss is God's word said, and God prepared a great fish. And people who just aren't smart enough to believe the Bible say, there's no way a man can live in a fish. There's no way on him. God prepared a great fish. It might not be a, a creature that's even around anymore. But God prepared. Amen. And God prepared this place to protect his people. But it gets even more gooder. gooder. <laughs> for you and I. Because Jesus says, I go to prepare place for you and where I go you know and the place you know and if I go to prepare a place for you I'll come back and receive you to myself friends we don't have to freak out about all this stuff God's got a place he's got a place on the rocks for the Jews when all this is, is, is going to go crazy he got a place for you and I in heaven when all this stuff is. what and I'm I'm happy we're going in the air not in a fish Right? Right? God can transport you to fish. I want to go flying, right? So God has prepared this place. And, and we believe that it is, it is Petra. It might not be, but we could trust God's got it handled, right? But everything is set where if they, could dro- they could drop the ball right now and people could leave Jerusalem and get to Petra because the King's Highway. And it's called the King's Highway. Of all. It's awesome. Anyway, let's keep going. So she fled to a place that God prepared, and look at this, that they should feed her. What was the prophecy we, we read? You take care of the outcast, you, 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 you treat them right, they're going to take care of them. The whole world's going to be against them, but God's going to have people to take care of his people. But here's the really cool part. For 1,260 days, how long is that? 42 months. And how long is 42 months? Three and a half years. Wow. Isn't our God so cool? Well, as we go into verse 7, this is really going to make the devil mad. So war broke out in heaven. And Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. Now, uh, Here's another one of these angelic battles that we read in the Bible. In the Bible and Michael's, Michael is a tough dude. We see Michael and Satan battling over Moses' body. We see Michael and the prince of Persia, either Satan or one of his top guys, battling uh, over there in the book of Daniel. So Michael is a tough rascal, right? He's, he's the de- defender. And here in heaven they're fighting. And I, I'm not sure how angels fight, but... That's going to be cool. <laughs> I just think that's going to be cool. Uh, and the tribulation is going to in- involve not only this great spiritual conflict, but remember, it's also going to affect us here on the earth. All this stuff is going on with Israel at the earth because Satan's trying to kill him. So he's doing battle in, in, in the heavens and all this stuff. And so it says in verse 8, uh, but they, Satan and his fallen angels, they did not prevail. Friends, he is a defeated foe, but he is a fighting foe. If anyone in here has ever struggled with an addiction, you know he's a fighting foe. If anyone here has ever struggled with a job loss, uh, a a, a marriage situation, the list goes on and on and on. You know he's a fighting foe, but he will not prevail. Nor was there a place found for him in heaven any longer. Can I be so bold to say this next line? And there's no place for him in churches any longer. He's more home in a lot of churches than he is out in the world. And that's a shame. Right? I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I I hear some of these nitwits and pulp. I'm sorry, that's not a very nice word. I'm I'm sorry. I'm trying to be better at that. I, I really am. You know, because the Bible says, here's how I get convicted. The Bible says we're not to judge another man's servant. But, boy, I want to choke them sometimes. (laughs) So I'm working on it. I I admit my faults. But I hear him saying some stuff that is so wacky. You know, we we see him promoting and 
putting their stamp of approval on things that the Bible says is an abomination to him and stuff. Mm-hmm. And there's no place for Satan in God's church. Amen. And so if you're going to a church and they're promoting these things that God hates, get out right away. Right? Okay. So he says, uh, no place for you in heaven any longer. So here he gets the final eviction. Matthew 12. I got this. I don't remember what this says. Gilbert, would you turn to Matthew 12 and read verse... Oh, I know what this says. Yeah, go ahead. Turn to Matthew 12, <laughs> verse 43 through 45. This is, this is interesting. This talks us about, about what they're doing when they can't be in heaven. This is Matthew 12, 43 through 45. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man and he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none, then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. So uh, here we see the wicked generation is going to be playing <laughs> religious games and messing around with demons and stuff. But here's the thing, and I've seen this happen. Notice in that story, the person will get clean, they'll get rid of a demon. Demons can't go back to heaven, so they have to find a a house here. They can't find a house here, so they go back to their host, who has been delivered. They find the house, swept and clean, Mm -hmm. but the house is unoccupied. We need to be occupied by the Holy Spirit. Spirit of God because if you're not occupied that rascal will come back and say hey I got it back and bring the buddies right friends we can't be messing around with the demonic world and you must be filled with the Holy Spirit of God and it's not a freaky weird thing that that people make it out to be right Jesus said just ask the father he'll give it to you yeah you better believe it and we need it desperately amen all right, let's get back to our... You guys getting anything out of my rambling tonight? Okay. All right. So he's cast out. Uh, verse 9, the great dragon was cast out. And here we identify who he is, the serpent of old. He appeared as a serpent in the Garden of Eden. He's called the devil. Do you guys know what the word devil means? It means slanderer. That's what the word means. And he is a slanderer. He's also known as Satan. Satan means adversary or accuser. Boy, all those names fit him, right? Mm -hmm. And look what he does. Who deceives the whole world. He he deceives the world by telling you you don't need God. He deceives the world like he did with Eve and messes with and manipulates the word of God. Tries to spin things. He deceives the world like he tried to deceive Eve by saying you can be your own God. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole Mormon cult is, is, is built upon you get to be a God someday. You know, we have a cool God, but I wouldn't want his job, (laughs) right? Who who would want that job? (laughs) But uh, that's one one of the lies. And again, a great deception is that God has changed his mind about sin. That's a, that's a lie, right? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. That's why we deal with him here. And the proclamation is made in verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren, that's another thing he does, who accuses them before our God day and night has been cast down. Once again, we see one of the things he does is accuse us before God and lies about us and all that kind of stuff but notice how Michael and them had victory because we learn how we can have victory it's found in verse 11 they overcame him by the blood of the lamb through Jesus' sacrifice the fact that Jesus was nailed to that cross died on that cross was laid in that tomb and three days later came out of that tomb alive grants us our victory by the blood of the lamb now False, there's other false messiahs that never come out of that grave, their graves. 
That's why there's no victory in them, right? But not only that, but by the word of their testimony. What's the word of our testimony? Well, they're words of faith. They're, they're words of, of the scriptures. Jesus, in dealing with Satan, said, it is written, and he quoted scriptures. Why is the enemy so working overtime to get the Bible away from us? He doesn't want you to know the Bible. Amen. He don't care if you sing songs. He don't care if you do all this other stuff. As long as you don't read the Bible. Because, the, you know, it's the Bible that will increase your faith. And why is testimony so important? You know, we've got to have a good testimony Sunday night, someday here Amen. at church. We used to have them at the Assembly of God, and they were good. Some people were crazy, but they were fun, you know. <laughs> you know, you have some sweet sister come up to testify, and it's like, oh, this is going to be good, <laughs> you know. And anyway, but hearing a word of encouragement from someone else encourages you, Amen. Right? You know what is a great encouragement to people who are struggling? You know, the Apostle Paul says that, that we will encourage others with the same encouragement that we've received. He used the word comfort. And sometimes the greatest boost to your faith is someone coming up to you and putting their arm around you, not in a weird way, but in a loving Christian way and say, you know what? Man, when I was walking in that valley, here's what God did for me. I made some bad choices, but God got me back. That's a word of their testimony. That's a word of their testimony. We have victory in Jesus through his blood. We have encouragement from other people. We have strengthening of our faith by the word of God. But here's the most important one, and this one I think a lot of Christians need to work on. And they did not love their lives to the death. What's that talking about? That's talking about trusting God so much that however this ends up, I'm okay with it. God, I, I don't really want pain. I really don't want suffering. I really don't want to be in need. But if that's not part of your plan, give me the grace to, to handle what, what I need to handle. Because my life is yours. You paid for it. I messed it up. You brought it back. So I'm with you, right? Total sold out to God. They didn't love their own lives to the death. Well, verse 12 says, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows his time is short. He's got three and a half years. And so now he's really, 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 really mad. And so he's going to take it out on humans and on the planet. The second part of the tribulation, which now we're going to enter into in our study, Jesus called the great tribulation. Why is it a great tribulation? Because it's not only dealing with the judgments of God, now it's dealing with the wrath of Satan. It's going to be a great tribulation. You see what's happening there? So now his focus is on the world, and now he's really mad at Israel. Verse 13, And when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. And once again, you know, in the earlier sections, he was trying trying to stop the, the child, but he didn't stop it. So now his focus is going to be on them just because they're Jews and they brought the, Hebrew, uh, the Messiah. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle. We just saw in the earlier verses to, to flee and to get to Petra, right? Now, I want to stop here because I've heard a lot of Bible teachers say, this wings of the great eagle... That's America. We're the eagle. Right? You guys believe that? No. Okay, good. Because how do we study the Bible? With the Bible. Turn with me, please, to Exodus chapter 19. Uh, the events in the book of Exodus took place before America was founded. Just, so you, just, to, <laughs> just to set this up. Now, you guys know I'm patriot through and through. Bleed red, white, and blue, right? I mean, okay. But let's don't, let's don't confuse patriotism with salvation. Amen. All right? Now, I'll die for my country. And I think everyone that knows me knows that. But our citizenship in the United States doesn't get us to heaven. Amen. Right? So let's, you know, we need to stand up for what's going on in the world because we still have... We still have freedoms and we still have rights as Christians, as Americans. And the 
Constitution and all these things that are being attacked. So we need to do our part as good citizens. But let's don't substitute that for our Christianity. Make sense? Okay. Uh, Exodus uh, 19, verse 4. Nine, Exodus 19. Did I say the wrong thing? I said what? Oh, I said it right. Okay. Exodus 19, verse 4. This is after they come out of Egypt. This is God reminding them. And he says, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Okay? The speaking of eagle's wings always talks about God's miraculous delivery from harm and danger. Now, go forward to Deuteronomy 32. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy 32. Verse 11 and 12. Everyone there? Mm -hmm. It says this, As an eagle stirs up its nest, hovering over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up and carrying them on their wings, so the Lord alone led him, and there was no foreign god with him. He made him to ride on the heights of the earth that he might eat and produce of the fields and made him draw honey from the rock. There's a new song out called Honey from the Rock. Have you heard that? It's really good. Yeah, it's really good about God's provision and protection. Have you heard that one? Brandon? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know who sings it. Uh, and oil from the flinty rock, curds for the cattle. Anyway, he's talking about their uh, um, God in the picture of this eagle, God himself delivering his people. Eagles, these magnificent, magnificent birds, the kings of, of the air, so to speak. You know, it's in the book of Obadiah, Obadiah 4. The people of the Obadiah, they thought that the, that the eagles nested on the moon because they would fly so high you couldn't see them. They thought they flew to the moon. So anyway, anyway, the eagle's wings are very powerful. They're symbolic of God's mighty power and his might. God is going to deliver his people, not America. Amen. Now, God might use America and some other nations. It's possible. That would be good for America, Amen. right? Because God blesses those who bless Israel, curse those who curse them. But God's going to get the credit. Not America. Revelation 12, still in verse 14. They were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place. Again, we just read about that in verse 6. Where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time, that three and a half years, from the presence of the serpent. God is going to keep them safe from Satan. Well, this is going to make Satan really, really mad. Look at verse 15. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman. Now, this is kind of weird. Can I get somebody, who would like to turn to Jeremiah chapter 46? Can I get a, Debbie will? And then I need one more reader. Deuteronomy 11, 6 and 7. Who wants to do that one? Candace, do that one again? Okay. Debbie, when you get to Jeremiah 46, read verse 7 and 8. 7 and 8. Mm -hmm. And I need one more. I need Isaiah 59, 19. Who would do that one? Gilbert's got it. Ready? I'm ready. Who is this coming up like a flood? Whose waters move like the rivers? Egypt rises up like a flood, and its waters move like the rivers. And he said, I will go up and cover the earth. I will destroy the city and its inhabitants. You said eight? Yep. Floods in the Old Testament passages represent armies of enemies that come. In the case we're reading in the book of Revelation, it's the armies of the Antichrist. Then I gave... Um, Isaiah 59, 19, who had that one? No, I think, Candace, did I give you Isaiah 59, 19? No, you gave her Deuteronomy. Okay, read, read the Isaiah one next. Isaiah 59, 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising sun. <coughs> Excuse me. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. So again, this is a picture of him sending people to come get these guys. And he's just going to have his army. He's just going to wreak havoc with it. And it says there that uh, the purpose is to, to wipe out Israel. But God's got them protected, right? Look what God's going to do in verse 16. But the earth helped the woman. 
And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Now, Numbers chapter 16 deals with this interesting guy named Korah who has a, a little revolt against Moses and Aaron. And starting at verse 29, God brings judgment upon Korah. And guess how he judges Korah and his cohorts? He made the earth open up. And they all fell in, and then the earth closed. God, they didn't even have to bury him. <laughs> right? And then, okay, Candace, did I give you Deuteronomy 11, 6, and 7? Yes. And what he did to Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab, the Reubenite. Now, the, these guys got the same punishment. Let's go ahead and read it. Uh, when the earth opened its mouth right in the middle of all Israel and swallowed them up with their households, their tents, and every living thing that belonged to them, but it was your own eyes that saw all these great things the Lord had done. These guys are doing the same thing. They're coming against Moses there and causing trouble and all this stuff. And, and so God just opens the earth, their house, their friend, everything goes down. There. God closes it back up. And God's reminding the people, hey, you saw me do this. Don't make me do this again. Because, you know, God, it's like God saying, don't make me pull this planet over because I, I will stop this. <laughs> <laughs> so we've seen an art life well few of us seen in our lifetime the six day war in 67, 68 you know how they won the six day war God, God sent a sandstorm <laughs> God will use nature we've read in the Proverbs with different things where God says man I'll throw snowballs at them you know? God can take care of this and so if he's going to open the earth now if you see Raiders of the Lost Ark <laughs> and you see the entrance to Petra, you have to go through a valley, a cave. Yeah. Not a cave, but a, a, a valley to get to it. Maybe he's going to, I don't know how God's going to do it, but he's going to take care of, care of his people. Well, this is really going to make Satan mad because it says, uh, verse 17, and the dragon was enraged with the woman. He can't get to Israel. He can't wipe him out. So he turns his attention. And it says, so he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. Whoa, hold on. If her, if her child was the Messiah, is there another Messiah? No. Who's the rest of the offspring? Us. Who does the world persecute today? The Jews and who's? The Christians. Not every church. Christians. Right? And it tells us here, her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Isn't that so awesome? He's going to turn his attention to the remaining Christians that are still on the earth at this time because he can't get a hold of Israel. Well, part two and part three of this unholy trinity is in chapters 13. You guys want to do chapter 13? Because it's, it's, tw it's 26 after 7, so it's running late. We'll wait and do it next week. You can read it. We'll do it next week. Okay, let's close in prayer. We'll release our viewing audience. Then if we have any questions or anything, my pen doesn't work. We will take it up now, but let's pray. Lord God in heaven, we thank you for this study. Wow, this truly is a great chapter with all these fantastic things happening. But Lord, the really cool part about it is, Lord, your protection, your planning, your preparing, your given victory, Lord. You are so awesome, and we are so grateful to be your children. Lord, help us as we continue to read this, and Lord, bring clarity to us. Father, help us to trust you. We have come up with some ideas and things that we think are going to happen. For example, the city of Petra. You might have another place. Lord, help us just to trust you in all things, in all situations that we find ourselves in. And Lord, I just want to pray right now and come against the spirit of doubt, the spirit of fear. Lord, you have not given us a spirit of fear. Amen. And it is a spirit from the enemy. And Lord, a lot of your people read things especially in the book of Revelation, and especially things like this. And they get f fearful. Well, Lord, we come against that fear in the name of Jesus. 
And Lord, I just pray that you'd give us confidence, trust, and the assurance that we are victors, we are overcomers through Christ who died for us. For we pray this now in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget, uh, this Friday night is our Christian movie night, 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary. We're watching the movie uh, Heaven is for Real. It's an awesome movie. I, I haven't seen it, but I've been told highly, um, highly recommended. So uh, be part of that. And make sure you check out all the great things that we have for you to do here at Lighthouse. God bless you. You may be dismissed.